If you have your Bibles, would you take it this morning and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter number 12. The book of Matthew, chapter number 12. And as you find your place, would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? We'll be reading the 47th verse, and I'll read the verse aloud. I'll ask that you'll follow along as I read it. Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 47. The Bible says, Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. And that was our pianist placed through a verse of a song. Let's all bow in a private prayer. And would you ask God to speak to your heart as Pastor brings this morning's message? You may be seated. I always try to remember the funny things that have happened during the week, especially if there's a smile or one-liner or, or a joke that uh, I could begin every service to get you smiling, at least to start with. And I had one all picked out. And somewhere between getting up this morning... And getting here, I forgot what it was. But the Honorable Judge Wright, who is a member of our church, texted me this morning to let me know that uh, he and his family, they, he was filling the pulpit at Danvers Baptist Church this morning. He's a preacher on the side. And they text me early, always lets me know when they're not going to be here. And I appreciate them so much. Hey, they drive up almost... Well, actually, from Lincoln all the time. That's a good distance. But he texted me, and he had autocorrect on his text. And uh, he, he typed, I'm filling the pulpit this morning. But what was sent was, I'm filling the puppet <laughs> in Denver's. This morning. Been there, done that before. And that was when I, I text back, I told him what he said. That made my day. And it made his too. I, I hope it did. God is always good, isn't he? And even in the, the darkest places in our lives, he, he sends a little bit of light. And I'm thankful for the ministry of Bayview Baptist Church, the family here. Those of you who are joining us by uh, our broadcast, we counted up, I, I think I told you this on Wednesday, but we counted up the number of people who are actually members of our church that faithfully watch us. And we have about 40, 40 to 45. And thank you for joining us and others that join us. You know, the broadcast is quite an outreach uh, for the church. And uh, people uh, tune us in from Can as far north as Canada and as far south as New Zealand. New Zealand is on a different uh, time. So I think they're getting it. Uh, uh, it's later in the day, not earlier there. And uh, from all around, uh, uh, people have caught us before from Italy and other places. Uh, friends of our church as well. But uh, it's Mother's Day, and, uh, you know, it used to be, uh, well, my mother and father were members here, my father still is, um, it used to be, uh, for, for 15 years, the first person, when I got on this platform, I'd look for was my mother. They always sat essentially in the same area. And then a few years ago, uh, three years ago, I think, my mother uh, went to heaven. And uh, I, this is the only t Sunday a year, Mother's Day, that I put my mom's picture 
uh, in my pocket and I preach on Mother's Day. I never want to forget uh, the mother God gave me. And uh, so I'll take it out of my pocket today and put it uh, near my computer where it always is. And I know she's having the time of her life with her Lord. And she's with her parents. And my grandpa, her dad, was the funniest man I ever, ever knew. There was nobody funnier than uh, uh, Grandpa Herwire. I would say this, Wally Wagner came close. And, of course, we pray for them. Uh, former staff members now pastoring in Tennessee. They've had their share of health problems. And uh, his wife as well from the COVID has eye uh, sight problems that have developed from COVID. Uh, but I, we believe it's going to get better. We want to pray for uh, Mrs. Steve Rowell this morning, too. Uh, he pastors down at Bethel Baptist in Pekin uh, during the concert. Uh, their grandchildren are here uh, in our school, and they let me know tearfully they were on their way home after the uh, service. The, uh, her mother, Mrs. Rao, had just taken uh, a turn for the worse with her COVID situation and was taken into ER. I have not learned what has become of that, but there's a lot of people to pray for. Still COVID around. Still around. Uh, and uh, it's a serious virus. There is no doubt about that. I know a few things about that. We've kind, of, kind of been blown out of the water a bit, especially the numbers, but it's around. And God has seen us through this. I remember when this first hit that, that uh, uh, wow, we were shut down. Well, the first month we shut down because uh, we didn't even know what it was. We didn't know if it was... Uh, an alien virus, jungle rot, we didn't know what it was. And as we learned more about it, we figured we could take the precautions. And uh, for a long time, uh, we took your temperatures at the door, made you, we sprayed your hands, remember that? And everybody was required to wear a mask, and then uh, gradually we began to let up. But it kind of hit our church all at once. You know, I, I had 19 of the 22 staff members down in the same two weeks. Uh, but, uh, it's like, uh, the, uh, Quaker, you know, they believe in, in hyper predestination and, and, uh, it's like the Quaker that fell down the steps and he got up and said, man, I'm glad that's over with, but, uh, I, I'm glad it's over with. We haven't had any COVID cases around here in our ranks for uh, quite a while. And we're humbly thankful for God's grace and, uh, by faith. We have chosen not to live in a bubble. By faith and the goodness of God, uh, we have returned to living our lives. And uh, we'll do that in our ministries as well. Uh, but I hope that uh, you'll always be respectful of people who choose to wear a mask. And also, you know, there's any number of places around town uh, that it is appropriate uh, expectation of you that you wear a mask. Be, a, be gracious about it. Be gracious about it. Um, I better not go any further than that. <laughs> I am so glad that you are here. And if you're uh, traveling, I hope you tuned us in today. And uh, God bless your mothers. But I used to look, right, we're... Mrs. Surratt is sitting right in there, my mother and father. My mother used to sit, and I'd always look for her first, all right? And finally, she went to, to heaven um, in upper 80s. And uh, so I had the peace of God that passed all understanding. I never dreamed I could preach my own mother's funeral. But God gave me the strength and I was proud of her on that day. So actually it came easier than what I knew. I, I couldn't wait to tell the whole world what a wonderful mom she was. My wife and I were blessed to be born into godly families. And uh, on both sides, we loved our mom. And now we both love our stepmom. We both have a stepmother. 
they too love God. And they are such wonderful, wonderful, wonderful ladies. And I'm glad that God brought them along for our dads. And it's been good. If God be for it, who can be against it? Amen. And so, my wife and I are reflections of uh, our parents, hopefully. And we are... Um, we feel that our lives have been blessed because of them. Numerous great men throughout history, not all of them, but a great number of great men in history had absent or drunken fathers, but their mothers were always there for them. And when you read these great biographies, that element is present in those books. When was the last time you looked at a 300-pound football player, look into the camera and say, Hi, Dad. I never have. But those who have looked into the camera hundreds and hundreds of times have always said, What? Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Most of you, maybe not all of you, but most of you, many of you, let's say many of you, have had a mother that was always there. As babies, you were rocked in the chair. I actually don't remember that. But I know I was. I had uh, a rocking chair for the longest time in my, in my office. Many of you might have remembered that. My father was rocked to sleep as a baby in that chair. And so uh, when it came time for me to pass it on, I passed it on to my sister's daughter, Erica, which would be third generation to have that chair. As babies, we were rocked to sleep by our mothers. As toddlers, we played at their feet. As school children, they packed our lunch, kissed us goodbye, and prayed for us during the day. As teens, mom never went to bed at night until we were safely home. Hopefully, by curfew or dad would take care of that part. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was no different. I'm preaching this morning a message called Mary was always there. Well, my, my dad remarried, of course, at age 88, to a lady that he knew since he was 19 years old. You know the story. Her and her husband and my mom and dad were a force, and they traveled everywhere together for years and years. And I... Uh, I went to youth group when I was a teenager in our church with her, with her daughters. So this is not new, but, but as it would be, uh, her name is Mary. And I love her to death. And I, they're an hour earlier in Michigan. They're up in Michigan this week. And I called her to wish her a, a happy Mother's Day. And she said, oh, your brother had just, uh, had just called. One of my brothers had just called. That's the way family should be, by the way. And if you have a family like that, when was the last time you got on your knees? Not just walked down the hallway, but got on your knees and thanked God for your family. And your moms. 
So I said, uh, I said, uh, you want to know what the title of my message is? Because they'll watch this later on. They're, they're in church now in Michigan, but they'll watch this afternoon, this service. I said, I'm preaching a, a message. Mary was always there. And she laughed. They were in the car on their way to, to church. But scattered throughout, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was not different than my, she was always there. Scattered throughout the New Testament are many references uh, to the presence of Mary near unto Jesus. Here's an incredible observation. Most of the references to Mary are parenthetical statements, just a statement that she was there. It doesn't say, uh, uh, it doesn't say, uh, uh, and by the way, uh, Mary's here by Jesus. Jesus was doing something and Mary was present. While most references, references to her are parenthetical statements of her presence, they have nothing to do with the story being told. The, the, Jesus is the subject of the New Testament. Jesus is the main event in the New Testament. But the fact of Mary's presence, that God the Holy Spirit made note of it often throughout the Bible, on purpose, Mary was present. Says something to us, doesn't it? Though not the mother of God, God calls attention to her very often. She was, Mary was always there from Jesus' birth to his resurrection from the grave. She was at the temple with her Son, Jesus. And like good Baptist parents, one day they got busy and went off and left one at church. Ever done that? Did we ever do that? My daughter saying. I know she's thinking that was probably one of my sisters running around the church. My wife is. I guess we did. And yeah, turn around and come back. Well, you remember Jesus teaching in the temple at age 12 and they got down the road and they had to come back. That was the only time in the Bible I ever read where Mary was not real happy with Jesus. She is respectful knowing that she bore the Son of God, but essentially... You worried us to death, son. And he, he smiled at the mother he loved so much. Would, wished you not that I would, would be about my father's business? <laughs> Amazing. Jesus had just preached and cast out devils and rebuked the Pharisees inside of a place he was. And the Bible says, Mary, the mother of Jesus, stood without. And went on to say, desiring to talk to him. When all of heaven was focused on the first miracle of Jesus that he ever did, the first verse of the first miracle Jesus did was, uh, says, and the mother of Jesus was there. Of course, he turned the water into wine. Throughout the life of Jesus, Mary was quietly there. And you'd get the idea from scriptures, although we do not know. She never really said much. At least it is not recorded so. When the shepherds came to the ma manger to worship the Christ child, Mary never took the microphone. The Bible says, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. 
I'll not list all the places. But I believe the darkest moment in Mary's life was to see her son hanging on the cross. Not just dying, suffering. If there ever was a time when she could not control her tears, this would have been it. And she ached for him. When he who knew no sin became sin for us, the Bible says, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. Loving her, before he died, he looked down to John the Beloved and he said, this is your mom now. Take her home and take care of her. And maybe John had a tear in his eye. And he said, I will. After he'd risen from the dead and ascended unto heaven. By the way, she was nigh unto the tomb also. The resurrection. She spent, uh, Jesus spent 40 days as a resurrected Savior. With family, friends, and ministry and disciples. After the resurrection from the dead, the 120 true followers of Christ had gathered together. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, this is just after he ascended into the heavens, they went back and they assembled together, reflecting on Jesus being carried up into the clouds. Verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. The resurrection of the dead makes it all right again. And as believers in Christ, and we have a graduation service, and this is just one of more than I can count that I've had here. Of course, we have many, many, many times more members in heaven than we have left. <laughs> we don't ever pass by the casket and say goodbye. Never. What do we say? See you later. You see, the resurrection makes everything all right. If you know Christ and you trust him and live by faith. And I was thinking about godly mothers. And their greatness. But in one sense of the word. Mothers are not greatness. Christian mothers are not greatness. Now, I would say my mom's great. But let me make an application here. Because this country doesn't know anything about this anymore. They've crucified the family. They've dishonored mother and given her a position that is... Not honoring. Godly mothers are not greatness. They are the authors of greatness. They are the builders of greatness. They are the maintenance of greatness all of their lives. Godly mothers are. Throughout Bible history and throughout the New Testament, we see this principle is true. Behind Abel was Eve. Behind Moses was Jochebed. 
behind Samuel was Hannah, who presented him unto the Lord as a small weaned child. Behind John the Baptist was Elizabeth. Behind Timothy was Eunice, his mother, and Lois, his grandmother. Susanna Wesley, you know that name. Susanna Wesley helped shape the spiritual destiny of two continents by raising two sons. John Wesley and Charles Wesley. Both young men, their ministries and their influence as God worked through them would change two continents. Susanna. In Kentucky... There was a godly woman. She didn't know anything about philosophy. She just taught her boy lots of Bible. She didn't know anything about science. But she taught her son all about creation. She didn't know anything about politics. But she taught her son all about truth. She didn't know anything about aristocracy. So she taught her son humility, simplicity, and she taught her son to serve. Her son's name was Abraham Lincoln. You get where I'm coming from? She wasn't greatness. She was the author of greatness. The builder of greatness. The maintenance of greatness. And though she is rarely mentioned in history books, Abraham Lincoln's not even named anymore. She died satisfied that her son served Today we honor motherhood because God honors motherhood. The humblest position on earth in many ways is motherhood. And yet greatness comes out of the same. No one wears more hats than mom. My mom wore a lot of hats. Wife, mother, child evangelism, five-day clubs held in our base. I was saved at home through one of her kids' clubs. Women's Missionary Society there at the church. For years and years, they would make crafts that you could assemble and send them to missionaries all around the world that the children they work with could assemble them, be a part of Bible school. She worked in the nursery. She was faithful. No one wears more hats than mother. No one has longer days than mother. Except right now, unless it was Brian Courier. <laughs> oh, forgive us what we have done to that man. He became the administrative principal of our Christian school. Plus, he still worked his full-time position in the church. So he averages about 12 hours a day and half a day on his day off. Because he wears too many hats at the moment. But his hair is not thinning. 
So I, I, I say nobody puts in longer days than mother. Uh, Brian Currier probably comes in close. No one cries more tears than mother. My dad was not a very emotional person. He was not melancholy. You didn't see my dad cry. But in his old age, I noticed the last 10 years, he cries a lot easier at that age. I never saw my dad do that. I cry more in my old age. Well, my wife will tell you I was not a, an emotional person. It was her sister that said of me, I couldn't be married to that man. And she said, God didn't make you to be married to that man. So I learned slowly as she was building the man of God to walk softer, talk softer, act softer around the queen of our house. But every once in a while, just in a, just a great while, I backslide a little bit. But my adult daughter is usually there to correct me. No one cries more tears than mother. No one prays more prayers than mother. No one tells more Bible stories than mother. No one does more in church than mother. And so today on Mother's Day... And I know that all of us fall short. Listen, I could preach on, on godly dads and I would know I fall short of the very thing I preach on. Okay, so we all fall short of the role we God has given us sometimes. Everybody. But it's good to hear it from the Word of God. Because it gives a sense of renewal in us that you know what? That's what I want to be. That's what I want to do. And sons and daughters should love the mother God gave them. Whether she's a Christian or not. And today, if she's not in heaven... If she's not alive, you need to call her. Say, well, I haven't talked to my mom in, in five years. Well, it's going to be a long call today, isn't it? You call her. That's the mother God chose for you. That in our parents we would learn how to do things and how not to do things. We would learn what to be and what not to be. And the lessons that mother and parents have for their kids are God chosen whether they're positive or whether they're, they seem like they're not positive at the time but they are helping to make you what God wanted you to become. Say, well, I had an ungodly mother. I, I don't want to be like her. Then you learned, didn't you? Listen, if you can love your enemies, you can love your mom. And God said, love your enemies. Right? I was preaching up at Providence Baptist College a few years back. I was teaching them to love their pastors. 
because he needs a lot of loving or he can't keep going. And a pious sophomore came to me. You see, freshmen know nothing. Sophomores know everything. And as God starts beating that out of them junior, by the time they're a senior, they know better. Sophomore came up to me and said, D didn't, you, didn't you mean respect your pastor? Not love him. You, you meant to say respect. I said, no, I didn't. He says, well, I don't know about that. And I said, how is it you can love your enemies, but not your pastor. And he was at a loss for words. I said, unless you don't love your enemies. I was trying to help him. Bring that back to Mother's Day. You can love your mom. If God can help you to love your enemies, God can help you to love a mom that you did not fully appreciate growing up under. Today is Mother's Day. If she's alive, you call her. You call her. Behind every great son or daughter is a godly woman who thought it not insulting to give her life to motherhood. Behind every godly mother is a great Savior who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Whether you are a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, I ask you, what place have you given Jesus in your life who thought it not robbery to be equal with God? Psalm 1, verse 4 says, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind, dry, uh, the wind driveth away. The ungodly, unrighteous, God said, the, it's like chaff. It'll dry out in its season and just blow away. The ungodly, are driven by the wind. You will find them among the woke crowd. Part of the most, some of the most ungodly people. They represent the most ungodly things I've ever heard of in my whole life and has nothing to do with racism. It's nothing to do with that. I'm just a little old American redneck. Once in a while, I'll get mad enough at a company where I just don't buy their stuff anymore. <laughs> I just don't. Say you don't make any difference. Yeah, but I feel better about it. For years and years and years and years and years at a Coca-Cola in my refrigerator. A couple weeks ago, that ended for good. And I went online and I looked for a company that wasn't trying to drive the, the godliness out of this world and, and, and say, we're a woke company. I found one. Dr. Pepper. Made by, uh, bottled by Snapple, which is, by the way, a Jewish bottling company. Snapple. So I brought some, I said, you know what? This tastes all right, too. So, that's, quite, that's the kind of old redneck pastor you have. God forgive me. <laughs> but you're not going to find the godly among the woke people. They'll be blown away like the chaff when the right time comes. You will not find them among the ranks of today's God-haters. 
you will not find them among the ranks of the cancel culture movement. And you're sure not going to find them among the ranks of the New World Order, which is the predecessor to the Antichrist. I could ask you of whose ranks are you, but you're here this morning. You're in a right, a right place. And you're watching this morning, if you haven't just turned me off a minute ago. <laughs> Only one time did Facebook this past year boot us off the air. To me, that was a badge of honor. <laughs> We're back on now. But you can always find us on YouTube and on our website, which we own. You can go to our website and nobody can knock us off there. But I don't hate those people. You know why? Because Jesus loved them and died for them. And all they need is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that can change anyone. There's a hymn. And I know, yes I know, Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean. I know because it made me clean. There's no such thing as a sinner that is so vile, so corrupt, so awful that Jesus doesn't love them and wants to save them and change their lives. So when you think of our politicians and those who rule over us. Don't pray, sick them, God. You pray, God, save them before it's too late. That Jesus can change their life. Don't lose your compassion for lost people. You were lost once. And God went looking for you. And found you. The Bible reminds us for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. In chapter 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God. Is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Our Lord. Romans 5. But God commendeth his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Much more than. Being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved. From wrath. Through him. And those of you who grew up in Sunday school. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him. Should not perish. But have everlasting life. So God in his love sent his only begotten son. That man would reject him and crucify him. He shed his blood in payment of our sin. He took our death penalty upon our, himself and he died in our place. And when he arose from the grave, he became the author and finisher of our faith. And now he says, whosoever will may come. He's a prayer away, no matter where you are. Whether you're here in the auditorium, whether you're listening online, he's a prayer away. And if you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior in a way that you are positive, you're on your way to heaven, please know this. You will not find salvation in somebody's denomination, church, or baptism. You will not find salvation by joining Bayview Baptist Church. 
John 5.12 puts it real simple. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know, K-N-O-W, that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Today, I know, I know, I know, I know. Not because I'm a good guy. I'm not a good guy. I know, I know, I know. Not because I was raised by a godly mother and father. No, I know because when I was a child, I accepted Christ Jesus as my forgiveness of sin and as my Savior. And when I invited him to come into my heart and my life, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And now these years he never has, and I know he never will. And shame on me in the times when I forsake him and I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Shame on me, but I don't want to do that anymore. God help me not to do that anymore. We have an amazing Savior whose love is beyond Yours and mine ability to comprehend. What are we that God would be mindful of us? We're a speck on a speck in all the universes. Or what are we that the Son of Man would visit us? Die for our sins. So now salvation is an undeserved and free gift. Just ask. He's listening. Are you certain you'd go to heaven if you died today? In Jesus, the Bible says, He that hath the Son hath life. Why? That you might know. And I know because what Jesus did for me was perfect, full of grace and full of mercy, wrapped in love. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes, nobody looking around, please. Of those of you who are in here, and of course, if you're watching online, I cannot see you. But how many of you are 100% sure you know you've been saved and you're on your way to heaven? You know that. If you know it, would you put your hand up? If you know it, all right, put your hand down. If you didn't put your hand up, I didn't see you because I was not looking for you. I just wanted you to get honest with God. If you could not raise your hand or if you're listening and you do not know the answer to that question, may I say Jesus is listening right now. Would you bow your heads and talk to him? He'll forgive your sin just for the asking. If you believe he was the son of God who loved you, who died for you, who rose again from the dead, if you believe that, God said you can be saved, just ask. And I hope you will. I'm going to ask you to stand and we'll have a short invitational song. My wife will join me down here at the front. If for some reason you need us to pray with you on the front row, you're welcome to come, especially about salvation. Two verses of an invitation song. You come.